Okay, welcome very, very much. It's so good to see you. And again, in the audience, welcome very much to the conversation. An honor and a privilege to welcome to the uh, program Ramsey Clark, who will probably need no introduction to a great number of the people in New York who are intellectually curious and concerned with the human condition. He was a former attorney general of the United States of America, and he's been an advocate. He's an attorney. He's been an advocate for many of the least among us on a world scale, both nationally and on a world scale, for a long and distinguished career, for which I thank him now. And I also am very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Ramsey Clark. Welcome very, very much. It's an honor to have you on the set. Well, it's good to be on the set and good to be on this program. I, I respect this type of television, and we need more of it all over, all over the country. Yeah, it's democratically oriented and so forth. And uh, you've had such an illustrious... Outline for the people. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Those words have meaning. Words do have meaning, I yeah. think. And um, uh, I, we, we, your, your life has been such a well-led one in terms of justice issues and so forth. We could go on talking on a great numbers of things. We were just talking to you new... Uh, Mortimer Adler, and you seem to have known it, and it's so well. But we wanted to just jump right in, as it were, on this March 10th, 2011, about the situation in North Africa, and particularly the country of Libya that we both had some association with. And I wonder, maybe we could just uh, uh, talk to that issue. What's going on? There's something very major going on on this planet now with the Tunisia, Libya, uh, Egypt, now Libya, and all that. What do you make of it all? And let's see if we can't try to put it in some historically meaningful perspective of uh, its meaning uh, on this March 10th, 2011. Well, the most important thing in the long run is um, the long-awaited <clears throat> uprising of the Arab people yeah. against um, autocratic governments um, installed and by the United States and to the profit of the United States and enforced by the United States. I mean, our, our e economic relationship with Egypt's been one of the great tragedies. Uh, none of the money went to the people. <laughs> it no. all went to the military and yeah. to corruption. And, right. uh, <clears throat> and it was the second highest aid program in, in, in the world Next for the United easier. States. And <clears throat> the uprising is, <clears throat> is wonderful. In yeah. human terms, yeah. it's dangerous because um, powerful capacities for violence oppose it, including the United States. And Particularly if it gets to where it's trying to really fulfill the cries for an abstract notion like freedom. Yeah, or democracy. It, or democracy. They're, they're both very important. What they're really about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's, um, uh, but the, it's a it's a bare beginning, mm -hmm. uh, and the beginning will very difficult and long way to go. Mm -hmm. Even with Egypt, as uh, humanly exhilarating and joyous as um, driving Mubarak out, uh, establishing a stable government of the people is an extremely difficult task from where they are today. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, I mean, we'll defend Bahrain with everything we have. Um, we'll tr try to hang on to um, Libya because of its oil. Libya's a small country. I mean, it's it doesn't have a third of the number of people that Cote d'Ivoire has. There's really? more, yeah. more violence in Cote d'Ivoire right now, more people being killed in Cote d'Ivoire right now, mm -hmm. and the civil war, a real civil war that's going on down there. Uh -huh. And we pay no attention. You can't even find it in the, in the right, media hardly. Right, right. But they're black and they don't have oil and they're yeah. poor and all the rest, whereas yeah. Libya is the highest income country in, um, in Africa. Yeah, highest yeah. Per capita also, income. huge reserves of oil. Huge reserves. But they've, to... they've, it's. Um, Unlike uh, most of the other oil companies, it's been beneficial for the people. Ed Thank you. Education there mm -hmm. has, has been uh, the best in Africa and the highest levels of literacy and the highest levels of higher education. And uh, Yes, sir. It just We just <coughs> talked to Artis Shiromani, a program aired today. It went from near zero in 1969 to 92 percent literacy. Yeah. And all the other statistics kept by the CIA on that are equally uh, commendable in terms of the progress that has been made in a brief 40 years. Health care and all the rest. Yes, the, right. the government, uh, whatever else it's done, it's uh, benefited uh, the vast majorities of, the, of, of its people, whatever their tribal or religion or other conditions. Yeah. And. Um, 
our concern is uh, of extreme hypocrisy. A couple of illustrations should make that clear. Ronald Reagan ordered aerial attacks on Libya in 1986. Yes. He based his <coughs> justification, if you want to call it mm. that, <coughs> on the bombing of a disco in Berlin where a GI American soldier was killed, mm -hmm. uh, some woman was killed, and uh, I think she was North African actually, mm -hmm. and others were damaged, a lot of damage, <coughs> and he ordered attacks on Libya. Killed his adopted daughter, <coughs> Hannah. Well, it did more than that. Mm -hmm. um, it, first, you have to look at the attack. Mm -hmm. Here's one death and no trial, no time for a trial, no real investigation, whatever. No. He orders an attack. Rumor, based on rumor, actually, was it? We rumor? don't know what they, what they thought they knew, but uh, whatever they thought they knew, he ordered attacks from Lackenheath Air Force Base mm -hmm. in England right. and from two aircraft carriers, the United States Navy mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean. I think the Nimitz? The Lackenheath mm -hmm. <coughs> was a major U.S. air base yeah. in England. Yeah. No country in Western Europe was, would give us overflight. They uh, had to rights. fly around Spain. They had to fly out over the ocean mm -hmm. and the uh, Atlantic and come in through the Straits of Gibraltar yeah. and the Gates of Hercules and mm -hmm. come in over the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they had to be refueled two or three times. Mm -hmm. They uh, came in off the water after midnight mm -hmm. in the dark. Mm -hmm. They wanted a surprise attack. Mm -hmm. And they did enormous damage. Yep in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. The aircraft carrier planes hit uh, Benghazi mm -hmm. over on the east side of the country <coughs> and did a lot of devastation there. There were scores of people killed and, and that's the best we can say, but there are really hundreds. There are at least 400 people killed in my, in my opinion in Tripoli. I went over there within days, first visiting people in the hospitals. They didn't have enough hospital capacity for burn cases mm -hmm. and they uh, had scores of people with serious burns in uh, Rome, Zurich, and Vienna. Mm -hmm. And the families were there crowded around the bed when they could get in and, uh, and uh, stunned and angry. Mm -hmm. But uh, imagine that. Uh, here's the President of the United States ordering an attack. <coughs> the um, a sleeping city in Tripoli particularly, the people were terrified. They didn't of know course. what it was. A thousand started trying to leave the city. There were automobile accidents and some mm -hmm. people injured and killed, of literally course. trying to flee from the city. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, one of the uh, four embassies were hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it shows French, how, I know. how yeah, careful yeah. they were. Yeah. The whole back side of the French embassy was sheared off mm -hmm. if you saw it. There was a, a six-story apartment house behind it there. And uh, that thing was totally destroyed. A family of seven lived on the top uh, floor. Six were killed and, and one young boy, mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't too young, he was early teens, mm -hmm. uh, survived. He came over for our trial in a, sitting in a wheelchair in the United States District Court. Yeah. The only person that could get over here, so here's his counsel and one Libyan in a wheelchair and the whole courtroom filled with U.S. brass. What was the courtroom and what was that? I, I, that'd be well, worth mentioning. Yeah, I, filed, I wasn't aware. We filed a suit for um, families and survivors for the deaths of um, people killed. How did it prepare in the court? Well, it got tossed out. Just uh, tossed out. Did they call it frivolous or what? No, they called it, uh, <coughs> we sued Margaret Thatcher <laughs> in the UK you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because she authorized the, uh, the use of the flight. Mm -hmm. You can't just bomb a country on her Well, one people morning. do do that in the name of uh, Genghis Khan didn't have to get any, you know, I mean, yeah, there's been yeah, a lot of that kind of marauding going on out of history. It took him a little time to get there and, yeah. and a lot of expenditure of energy. Here you just, you send those yeah. jets around and they, um, <coughs> the heartbreak, I mean, they, most of the people killed were Libyans, but there were Palestinians and others mm -hmm. that were, were killed. Um, I followed, the, you know, I went over there and spent some time and went back three or four times uh, before we got through. Mm -hmm. They did want, it was an assassination attempt too. Yes, it was. The first Bombed was, the house. Bombed well, his house. It, it targeted the first, it. The first jets came off. They mm -hmm. made sure that there was no strike before they came out to this <coughs> compound that uh, Gaddafi had on the, on the southwest side of town, mm -hmm. <coughs> Tripoli. They hit uh, his office building because mm -hmm. he worked there at night sometime. Mm -hmm. 
There's a big, it's a big office, big yeah. government office building, but still in the compound. Mm -hmm. They hit the corner and demolished it where his office was. Mm -hmm. They hit his home. Mm -hmm. They had, he had a tent out several hundred yards south of the uh, of the house, mm -hmm. and they c collapsed that. He often spent the night out there. It's yeah. kind of a sort yeah. of Bedouin right. guy from a Bedouin yeah. background likes yeah, to right. do. And um, you remember that they killed uh, this, this little child, uh, this little girl, who um, apparently was an adopted daughter of. Uh, Gaddafi in the house. If I'm not mistaken, I think they wounded, it's Safe is his name now. I think when I was there soon after you were, uh, he was only a lad of 12, and I remember him being on a cart, and he had been wounded. In yeah. It, if I'm there, not mistaken. There were two yeah. people, the, 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 the little girl was killed, and um, the little boy was injured, but it, 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 there were tragic injuries, yeah. and thousands of them. Right, they, right. Uh, Casper Weinberg, our Secretary of Defense, said it's impossible that anybody got killed. <laughs> yeah, right. When you think right. of all those planes coming in there and, and bombing as they did. It would be worth mentioning, and it's, it, to put it in perspective, it would be as though somebody had come and bombed the White House and killed Amy Carter. I mean, that's stretching yeah. it, but you understand, it's yeah. in not human a terms, small matter. Uh, in human terms, a, a life is a life. Yes, and, sir. Uh, there were hundreds people totally uninvolved and totally unaware, just mm -hmm. leaving, sleeping at night, most mm -hmm. all of them probably, yeah. uh, they were killed yeah. in their sleep all over the town. Right. right. But particularly uh, concentrated mm -hmm. in the heart of the city. And around the French embassy. Uh, well, around the, uh, there's yeah, an embassy yeah. area there. Yeah, they, right. They hit three other embassies. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, and, and did enormous damage uh, all through um, the city and killed a lot of people. What kind of crazy country does a thing? And like he that? called them the mad dog of the Middle East. Uh, yeah. In very but, um, incendiary language, and they seem to have a <coughs> strong brief against him. The, um, well, we have to face up to our responsibility. Now we we're we're saturated at night with uh, the horror of what's happening to civilians in Libya. But we look what we did to civilians in Libya: right. defenseless civilians with. Sophisticated modern aircraft yeah. that were flying thousands of miles. To, uh, to it's get interesting there. the difference in our attitude toward that country than in the other cases of Egypt or Tunisia and so forth. That it seems to be Libya and uh, his position, historically and otherwise, that gave uh, such uh, grief to so many of the geopoliticians. Uh, might make one wonder because it seemed to be he had a great deal of concern. Mandela had a very close relationship with him. He seemed to represent uh, the liberation movements of the time. Most of the American Indian tribes could relate to him. Peoples who had been oppressed, a good deal of the black community of the world could relate to him because he was an anti-imperialist attitude in the world that is hard to uh, swallow by the people who are selling the imperialist view of the world. Yeah, our minorities uh, went over there in, in streams, and particularly mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the Native Americans and uh, and African American people in the movement, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they identified with him. Well, our problem with him was he was independent. Yeah, he didn't he didn't do what we said. He didn't handle his oil reserves like we wanted him to, and. Uh, had an and issue so we were, with Occidental Petroleum, and Wheelis Air Force Base was closed down yeah. soon after the uh, so we revolution. Had to, the SAC base. He wouldn't follow our uh, command, and he uh, and he had he had uh, he was on the side of some of the least advantaged people in the world in the movements of supporting them. It's recognized now. Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, some of these other same, countries same are in support on, yeah. of him in memory of the fact that he was not a normal uh, a person who just took all the riches and then would, you know, go to the Monaco and gamble and so forth. He, he had a social conscience that it <coughs> resonates with a lot of the least advantaged people in the history uh, in, uh, around the planet. That's something to remember. He was very active remember. in the African Union and uh, very supportive of the African Union. Yes. Hard for, for an Arab leader to be because there's, there are only a few more than half a dozen countries that are uh, Arab. Mm -hmm. and the, uh, maybe seven or eight um, out of nearly mm -hmm. 40 countries, maybe more than 40 now, and the because uh, we keep dividing them up. <coughs> but um, <coughs> he, he um, th then the, it's very revealing that in 2008, yes, Libya had been on our state sponsor of terrorism list. Mm -hmm. They're about seven at the, at the height, the highest number of countries ever on the list. 
it meant you didn't have sovereign immunity here in, the, in our court. You could sue for, you could sue Libya here in the United States courts. Uh, so there are billion dollar suits brought against Libya for. Trivial? Well, some were trivial and some were real incidents. The question was Libya's liability. Yeah. The uh, Panem 103 would be the illustration that everybody in the country <coughs> knows Locked about. But, but he, he forced the, um, the, the United States, Bush forced the Pan Am plaintiffs who had fought for years mm -hmm. to, uh, and that's a heartbreaking loss of life there, <coughs> to, to accept a billion dollars in, in, in settlement. We have cases uh, against uh, Palestine and against the PLO, that is, mm -hmm. <coughs> and against uh, Libya and against um, uh, <coughs> other countries on the list where a single death claims a billion dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and here you've got, <coughs> but they, what they settled, the, they settled in 2008 at the command of the United States government for a billion, 300 million. Mm -hmm. And then they allocated the 300 million to the victims <laughs> of the <coughs> 1986 bombing <laughs> all these years later. Yeah. So they never accepted guilt. They accepted they denied the, they denied they did, liability. They did, they, they, no. they they did not no, they, they they do not accept the quarter of Magrahi. I don't think they accept the people of Libya accept him as guilty and there might have been another place from which uh, the Becca and so forth was the no, original what they, story. what they were doing has nothing to do with any of that. What they were doing <clears throat> was taking Libya off the list because they believed that U.S. companies were going to get, as a result, uh, part of the oil business. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. They were coming in. Mm -hmm. But they took, the, the, the U.S. government agreed to take 300 million, mm -hmm. which is just about the same figure that we sued for, mm -hmm. for the deaths, uh -huh. and, and gave it to Libya mm -hmm. to pay to victims of our 1986 bombing. Is that what happened, actually? I didn't Absolutely, realize. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, it's public, I public oh, record, and there's no oh, question about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, I mean, think how cheap that is. Yeah. Here they denied liability and paid nothing and kicked us out of court on sovereign immunity mm -hmm. in 1986. Uh -huh. And then how many years later, 32 years later, they come back and pay $3 million, $300 million, mm -hmm. <laughs> to these victims from an oil settlement <clears throat> in 2008 mm -hmm. in order to... To um, for U.S. companies to get some oil business out of out of Libya. To get some options. This is a, this is fairly recent, you know. Yeah, that, that's just three a, years ago. Yeah, that's right. Less that was, than three years ago. That was after he took a different tact in 2003 and so forth. And uh, uh, that is, Mr. Qaddafi took a different tact, and he came in. He had had these crippling sanctions that had voted down uh, on them. It was very very difficult for them to function, and so there was a change in 2003. <laughs> And one wonders how many people, when you get these statistics, uh, education, all of the statistics, housing, he, and he had this idea of a job, he had an ideology, he had a view of, uh, uh, of what the go how the government should be organized. They had suffered terribly a holocaust under the Italian fascists particularly. As many as a third or perhaps a half of the population had been ruthlessly decimated in a holocaust by the Italian fascists. And they had suffered, and they were very, very poor when the revolution, and they made all of this progress. There must be, in logical terms, you'd never get it from the press reporting going on now, but there must be a lot of people who have either directly benefited or could see the validity of the way in which they tried to organize that society is what he called a jamaria. People's Congresses at participatory democracy and involving uh, the people of the country in the ownership of the capital assets of private sector activity rather than only wage earners. He had signs everywhere, partners, not wage earners, which is an idea that's confronting the world now as the uh, economic meltdown of 2008 and Mr. Keynes saying that you're going to have problems with uh, technological displacement of labor in their maturity about now with cybernetic development, that we, we, he, he, he was presenting a pattern that presented a different way, political organization in economics, 
which involved ownership on the part of the masses of the people in the technological base of the capital base of production. None of that matters. Which could our, be an ideological... Our policymakers pay no attention to anything like that. You they, don't think so? Not even somebody? Somewhere? Well, did they? I mean, they... I'm not sure because they wouldn't because the, the it's, it was rather like the United States... They were States, out for the oil. I mean, uh, they, they, they the, weren't interested in the welfare of the Libyan people. You think no, were, not, not interested were in any... Were they interested in the welfare of Libyan people when they bombed them in 1986, no, in the no, middle of the night? <laughs> no. Of course not. You know, well, I, I've thought about that, whether or not they could foresee or see that he might, at an ideological sense, when they've got all this power and so forth, to make any sense of that. But you can make a comparison between the United States of America in 1776 with the feudal order that it held for a thousand years in Europe. <laughs> And the feudal order was, what are these bumpkins across the ocean talking about something called democracy when they were used to and have all kinds of institutions <coughs> reified around a feudal order? You see, that has no relevance right now because you, you, don't got, think the whole, so. you, well, you got the whole Arab world uprising. That's true. E Egypt's uh, 20 times the size of, uh, of Libyan population. That's right. So, That's right. Okay. So what, uh, what, can, what can Libya do in that regard? The, uh, oh, okay. <coughs> they were after okay. oil. This is... This had to do okay, with oil that, and the... Uh, that is an easier track to follow, yeah, right, well, than a historical I mean, transformation. And the thing broke, all the attention was on Egypt uh, a couple y of months ago. That's right. Nobody's yeah. paying attention to Libya. Yeah. The idea that that our anger now is based upon the fear that, uh, and what we're doing now, uh -huh. I say our anger, our show of anger yeah. by the government, is uh, if, you, if you look at our history, we didn't care about those people. We bombed them in 86. And, we denied them compensation. Mm. We traded off in, in 2008 to get uh, get money, and uh, it's um, it's just not credible to think that um, it was the government they had built that uh, is causing our anger at them. We want to get him out because he's independent because he does what he thinks is right, whether yeah, it's right or wrong. Yeah, that aboard this ship. If, yeah. he, if he did the wrong thing for us, as, as other dictators had done, he would have been their man. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he wasn't, and that's, right. uh, so you... But there must be, oh, no, at the popular level in, in, in Libya, there must be a great number of people who are truly in favor of Muammar Gaddafi, you wouldn't know it from the news that we're getting now. He is almost Genghis Khan incarnate, or just the, the news <coughs> reporting and what's being passed for that within the media just assumes that all the people from Benazi are, Benghazi are really, the Senussi are really great liberated people, and, the, and he is a terrible, ruthless dictator, which I don't think would comport with the attitude of a lot of people within Libya, That's particularly pretty, in the West. It's pretty obvious. I mean, a third of the population of the country is in Tripoli. Yeah. And uh, you haven't seen, uh, I mean, the, you, you mm. even you watch uh, CNN or U.S. television, and you see people are on the streets there, the, the shops are open, and uh, they, they follow any violence that occurs or any demonstration yeah, that arises. Yeah, always but, uh, does, yeah. You've got, the, you've got Saudi Arabia announcing that uh, they're going to shoot demonstrators. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the we say Gaddafi's shooting innocent people. Here's Sa Saudi Arabia. Has been any outcry about the Saudi Arabia saying, if you uprise, if you get in the streets and demonstrate, we're going to shoot you. We've well, they did. You. They Our did that people. in Bahrain. You got the Fifth Fleet right there, and you got them tied right into. And that's the big Kahuna, uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That's now, gonna now be, you're getting to the reality of the yeah. situation. Well, in it's, that sense, uh, yeah, you understand. I understand our interests that. are are not in. Uh, Anything ideological? Well, they're not in the welfare yeah. of the people. They're, the ideology is oil and money. Yeah, yeah. It's wealth yeah. and power. Yeah. Well, that sounds like uh, you know colonial attitude toward the world has been characteristic of a great number of things well, that went a, on. It's a neo-colonial. Neo-colonial. Neo I guess you got to get the neo <laughs> in there. Yeah. 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 It would seem that way. Uh, and also, what what's going? On? You've got a thing where they're they're, they're reporting. That uh, and I would really welcome your understanding from a legal perspective. How do we differentiate between a country? Because what it seems like, you have this very deep-seated Sanusi thing. They never did go along with the Gaddafi uh, revolution of 1969 in the east. It was tribal, Sanusi. There's a whole group of them. There's another in the south and then Gaddafi in the east. So it's, it's tribal-based, and that's very meaningful. They've made all this, uh, but it seems to be like what is coming to be a it's not just an uprising, although that's still the recognized uh, country of Libya, includes Benghazi in the east and so forth. 
But how do we distinguish between a, a conflict between peoples within a country uh, that are in what is like a civil war as opposed to an uprising? And how do we deal with that kind of a condition? Because it seems to be we may be in for a civil war in, uh, in Libya between the East and the West. We had one here in the United States between the North and the South. A war is a different thing than a uprising. Can you put all of that in some sort of a legal perspective for us? Well, it's all illegal. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, uh, in some philosophical legal thing. No, uh, a war, you, when you, war, you, when there's a war, all gloves are off. You understand what I mean? It's a whole one, different one context. Out there. there is the tribal, and, and people are always raising that. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if you were ambitious to be rich and uh, you were living in Benghazi and you saw that oil just south of you there and you thought uh, the possibility of breaking it loose from, from Tripoli and, and getting hold of it, uh, you might start uh, organizing, you know? You might start yeah. trying to drive to take... A, who's going who's gonna to inherit control and wealth from that oil beside the exploitation from abroad? Okay, right. There are people okay. in Libya that will benefit greatly from it. There could people benefit... Really so like you, the, you've yeah. got... Of course, that doesn't mean you don't have thousands of people that, are, that would like uh, to have a different government. Right. But then particularly in Benghazi and particularly on the east side there, and particularly and down in the in, in the desert, some or south where very few people actually live, mm -hmm. comparatively. I mean, yeah, sure. it's, it's still a small country. Yeah, yeah, four million, I mean, five million, yeah, 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 like Norway. Yeah, well, it's you know. Nor I mean, in the sense of five million with a lot of oil wealth. Yeah. And spread out over big territory. Well, and spread out among the people. Not spread out so much, but it has a huge territory. It's yeah, all and the also they, they've gone from ze near zero literacy to 92%, and all the figures are that way. There's got to be support among the Libyans for what he has done, even though there'll be people in opposition. There's got to be a great deal of support. You get none of that in the media now, that there would be a basis of support for him, and he's not just a goon that is a, you know, a gangster no, you do, who's you holding on. You do get on. some, but you have to look hard. I mean, the media is beating the war drum to attack... Terribly uh, so. ...to attack Libya. Yeah. It's not just what he's done, it's what's happened to the country. I mean, the country's got its own life, and uh, education there far exceeds in quality and in accessibility, uh, education at the primary and secondary and, and college level of any country in, in Africa. Oh, no doubt. The yeah. income level, is, is, and it's spread out among the people. It's not mm -hmm. just a few rich people. Well, you see, that spread out among the people is something in a democratic, you know, that's something that is uh, not, it's hard for people. Well, we don't do too good, if you want to call it I'm, a democracy. This revolution that's going on there, when is it going to come to the United States of America to question the fact that all the capital assets are owned by a tiny plutocratic class, uh, the capital assets are increasingly responsible for production in every political entity everywhere, including the United States. It's getting down now to where it's just 1% are benefited by tax cuts and so forth. It's plutocratic everywhere. And when, is there, going, plutocratic. when is there going to be? Always has it's been. more plutocratic than it's ever been. I think so. I mean, Sarah Flounders told me it was more concentration of wealth in the United States than there was in 1789 France in terms of a disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And that I mean, was, that was about as extreme as, as you get. They do, yeah, and you but, saw what yeah, happened. It's become, but it's, when will this will this thing ever come and redound to the United States and something other than this crazy Tea Party composition that's coming out? Is it going to come in effect? When will a revolution come to the United States of America, if it ever, uh, it, within what's going on in terms of real democracy be having a meaning? Uh, we just assume historical legitimacy. We are the carriers of history in a legitimate way. Soviet Union imploded. We're the carri We're legitimate. Everything else is illegitimate. Right. Well, you know, the philosophers say what I'm comparisons saying? are odious, and it's, it makes no sense to compare the conditions of the people in the United States to the conditions of the people in Egypt, Yeah, say. okay, yeah, right. Okay. Even the concentration yeah. of wealth is entirely different. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, we're not going to have an armed revolution. We're going to have a democratic revolution if the people ever wake up. But the probability of an armed revolution here is, uh, even with all of our guns, which is, we have a revolution in terms of crime, but uh, and we don't have the courage to face up to the fact that guns are responsible for a lot of them. There'd be a lot less violent death in this country if we do something about gun control. Are we ever going to have a, an, an economic policy that distributes equally or in an appropriate way in order to what the future allows, a qualitative change in terms of uh, giving some sort of a deal 
to the least advantaged among us, which we don't have. It all goes to the top. No, not until you have a democracy. We are a plutocracy. A an We've been a plutocracy all of our existence. It is it possible to have an econo a political democracy where you get to vote every four years or something, and an economic plutocracy? We're certainly an economic plutocracy. Well, you can, as you know, is all the world. With, with the control of the media and all, you can yeah. hang on for a long time, okay. uh, much more easily than you could in the past. Uh -huh. But still, if you had a, a real democracy, but we don't have a, a real democracy. You can say, that, well, everybody can vote, can't they? Mm. But they're saturated with, with media. Absolutely. And most don't vote except in presidential elections and right. a few right. other elections at times. So we, the, the capacity to control the election is, 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 is extreme. Yeah, right, right, and, right. And you look at, look at the, local, the local elected officials, and most of them have got businesses in the community that are supporting them, so therefore the business is there. And the state level, the big businesses in the state are financing the campaigns. You've got yeah. the Supreme Court now saying that a corporation is just like a person. I get, know. Well, you're all the reifying, that, reifying that, inter, that, that well, thing really by is, Mr. Roberts. It's, yeah. really, it's just heartbreaking to see that decision. I can't believe <coughs> it, it can survive. But, What's uh, going on <coughs> in Madison and so forth now where they're going to try and do away with uh, collective bargaining and all the things since 1950 that had meaning to building a wide middle class is being challenged from the right and so forth in this country. And it's coming now. The implications in terms of Democracy, and when you use that term, it's a big one. Uh, Mr. Uh, your Mortimer Adler, would, his philosopher, democracy, I think it's very difficult to have a democracy if you don't have economic justice or economic uh, system that we don't have. We're connected to, and uh, that's one of the things that no, we need to have some sort of a qualitative transformation on this planet, particularly when you've got weapons that are species lethal. I believe they are at a modeling level. It's a new existential reality, and we don't seem to have leadership that is giving or any view of what the future requires for the interrelated system that, you know, the, the people of the world. They don't have vision, those who claim historical legitimacy, it would seem. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much a question of vision, but it, they're in, on the payroll. I mean, they're indebted to a segment of the society for their holding office. Yeah. And it's because money dominates our politics. Best money, money dominates best Congress politics. money can buy, Greg has. Pallas told us. He always has. I right? ran for the Senate here in New yes, York sir. in 1974 mm -hmm. uh, and had a $100 limitation. Mm -hmm. And you just couldn't run. Mm -hmm. uh, I beat four people in the Democratic primary, but uh, run against Javits, who had, he raised $2 million about a week before the election. <laughs> yeah. And right. his, uh, everything you saw on TV was, were his commercials. And, yeah. But it's because money dominates. Yeah. And you've got to get an attractive person. He's got to talk sensibly to the people. But uh, he knows um, what put him in office and what keeps him in office, or her. Uh, it's like an ad campaign. You know? It's like an ad campaign to sell Wheaties rather than cornflakes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was his name? The one, uh, the, the one who talked about the hidden persuaders, Vance Packard. Yeah. How easily they can manipulate the population through the media and that sort yeah. of thing. But back again to Libya. So what? What I asked you, I asked you this: How do you differentiate between a country that has an uprising and one that is at war? How do we deal with at war situations within a country? We had a great civil war led by our forces by Abraham Lincoln, who was going to preserve the, all of this. We fought. 600,000 people were killed in that. There's a difference when there's a yeah, war. A and do we have a war, war. shaping up? In, is that a war in Libya that's shaping up, a civil war? How do we distinguish a civil war from an uprising and that sort yeah. of thing? Well, I think the or more, demonstrations? I don't think the definitions are important. I think what, okay. you, what you need to do is analyze what's happening there. Thank you, thank you. And you've got... Um, a number of different uprisings. <laughs> yeah, you got some people that are just mad as hell, so to speak. And you're uh, talking about Libya or the talk about region? Libya now. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. But right. Every place is different. Yeah, uh, there there are a lot of people just mad as hell. There are mm. a lot of people that see an opportunity to share an oil wealth directly and controlling uh, oil in the east. Uh -huh. There are people who've got gripes or complaints. Yeah. Uh, as as always, any, there are. Yeah, any, yeah in any any human world, organization, any human yeah. organization, yeah. collection of people. <clears throat> so you've got. <clears throat> and, and you've got the um, reverberations of the huge uprisings in Egypt and, uh, right. and the much bigger up uprisings in other parts of the Arab world. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
But we, we pay no attention to where the real killing's been going on. East Congo, you know, we watched East I know, Congo, hundreds horrible, of thousands of people slaughtered horrible. there, and nobody says a we word. We sat by and watched Rwanda, didn't we? And here, here in, uh, in Abidjan itself, but all over uh, Ivory Coast, which is... Um, Sierra Leone, they had a while back. Yeah, but right now, today, yeah, yeah. there's a civil war, what they call a civil war going on, because there are two presidents elected. You're talking Ivory Coast. Then. Ivory Coast, yeah, Cote yeah. d'Ivoire. And, yeah. and it's, it's centered around two people elected president. One who's a former employee of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ever heard about that before? Yeah. Who's, uh, well, who's obviously supported by the West. And now, we call that a civil war. Yeah. You, if, what, if, what if you want to get into this... definitions, that's a fair one to call a civil war, because you've got two leaders, two separate guys that are claiming to be president and they're riding around them, but well, they're tribal have, yeah. splits and all that behind them. Yeah, but if you've got two things, you've got the Sanusi and you've got the Qaddafi, you've got east-west, we had north-south. Uh, you have yeah, a different... Libya, Libya is much more complicated than that. You uh, think I, so, yeah? Yeah, 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 I think you've got... Is this a drawn-out thing that we're going to see going on? Are there going to be line battle lines, that sort of thing? There are people talking about we ought to send uh, military support to the people in Sanusi, I mean to Benghazi, to support them because they're the good guys and Gaddafi's the well, bad guys. Well, it's not guy. just Benghazi. I mean, even, even between Tunis and uh, Tunisia and... Uh, Libya on the west of Tripoli, there's fighting going on there, and people say you ought to come in with airstrikes or, or the rest. Or yeah, and they're talking no-fly zone now they're going to do. They've sent uh, ships there. NATO is talking about doing stuff. They're all getting up in arms. And there's a drumbeat that's going yeah. on, and it just... It and puts, all for this, this relatively small country. Right. <laughs> when things are happening all over the world. That's uh, true. A that's different true. order and magnitude yeah, that have, right, to, be, have right. to be considered. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And our you know, friends like Saudi Arabia saying, we're going to shoot demonstrators. Is it, they've issued that from uh, yeah. Abdullah. I mean, it, it, yeah, I heard it on the radio this morning. They, they did shoot people in Bahrain. In well, Bahrain's I think they've already shot Chico some in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, probably. Uh -huh. <coughs> they've, been, <coughs> they've shot some everywhere. They shot some in Cairo. Yeah, that's very not, worrying. <coughs> not, what is uh, the implication in terms of the situation with Israel? If you get access to the people <coughs> in the street, that's still a big issue that's there and so forth in the Middle East. And then I wonder, there's another sidebar I want to get to because there's a mutual, Mr. Gaddafi is still in charge, I guess, of the country of Libya. You by can't the say that. He's in charge of... <coughs> with the de former. facto de jure. He's, he's, in, he's in charge of what's been the government, what remains of what was the government. Uh -huh. But there are areas where he can't uh, order something and have it done. <coughs> okay. Now, what happens with... But he did... And so the embassy staff here at the United Nations, I had done a program we aired last Monday with the fellow who's the, the gentleman who is the, and he has come on with others there who say <laughs> Mr. Gaddafi should step down. And Mr. Gaddafi is still the leader of the country, can make a decision, and you're familiar with the structure of the UN. And in the face of that, he, Mr. Gaddafi has uh, dismissed him and is appointed as his replacement, Ali Traiki, somebody we both know and much of the world knows. And as I understand from the reading of the uh, uh, BBC and so forth, the United States <coughs> has refused to give him a visa. Where does all that stand? Where does the authority lie in something like the UN? Can one group that the Americans disapprove of not be allowed to come to New York even though the government or whoever represents that entity says they would rather have a different representative? Uh, can you discuss well, you some you of the... you can't have a UN if that's possible. Well, you? that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that, well, we some of the dimensions <coughs> of that They play decision. games with that. You've watched it for years. Okay. <coughs> I represented the PLO for 30 years and... Uh, Sometimes they'd have to camp out for six days before they get a clearance, and then mm. they'd get to be hassled. It's just, it's just hassling. And <clears throat> oh, but it's not the UN that's doing it; it's the it's the US that's doing it. Right, the US will not give him <clears throat> a visa. It is said. Well, you don't. You, technically, or, you don't need a, a US visa to come to the UN. Okay, how head, does it work? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, the United States has a treaty yes, with the okay. United Nations called the uh, the Headquarters Treaty. Right. And we recognize in that treaty in return for the UN locating here in New York, mm -hmm. it can control who its visitors are within certain limitations, and uh, they can come in. Otherwise, they, how can it they... It would have to be. How could it be How can United they conduct Nations? their business any yes. other way? So, yes, sir. So it's, a, it's uh, just a, a matter of how you frustrate them, because most of the airlines coming in are from countries that we can... And you can keep them... You can frustrate them, is what you can do. You, you finally get in. Trachy is a, is a man of international renown. Yeah. He was president of the General Assembly of the United States, which ought to be the, the highest position in the United Nations, but oh. it's the only... All 194 countries there are 
95 now, I think. 195 now, maybe. They, they're growing like mushrooms. Well, they've grown three in the last yeah, several, right. years, several yeah, years. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> so you've got uh, all those countries voting for the president of the General Assembly. Here's a man that was president of the General Assembly, just about one or two before now, and who'd been pr twice president recently of the Africa Union and who had served here as permanent representative for Libya back in the 80s and early 90s. Absolutely. He's an international figure. And, he was uh, foreign minister, I think, too. Well, he's yeah. foreign minister before that. Yeah. Even, and after that, too. Yeah. The, uh, and he won't, they won't let him in. Yeah. Now, how can they do that? What I'm trying to get at, well, is that, is that just a delaying thing, or is that a, a harassing, or is there anything in the way the structure of the United Nations is and agreed to by treaty and so forth? That they, the United States government can take that position? Well, it's, or, it's I, I, you're obvious. a lawyer. You understand? No, legally they have no right to do it. Okay. How could the UN function if the United States could control who can come to the headquarters? Well, then why is it that it's coming over the wire that he won't be able to come because he doesn't have a visa? Yeah, because the United States is frustrating it. <laughs> That's why. Okay. So they're well, taking sides. <laughs> I mean, they're, in, in well, they're terms trying of to keep that, him out. He's a well-known international figure. He's got a lot of friends at the UN. You know, that's he, right. he knows probably knows two thirds of the ambassadors here. Now, who's here keeping personally. him out, and why, and why this drumbeat there, and what does it mean in terms of geopolitical realities, uh, oil interests, whatever, that there is this animosity that's developing around this country of Libya, and that we're taking sides, the United States. <clears throat> And we're the countries more we're taking sides, we're generating most of it. I mean, we're generating it. You would think, right? Oh, absolutely. DIA, no, CIA. And we're keeping Mr. Trachey out. There's no. Um, how could the UN keep him out? <laughs> well, that's He's what I'm asking. In a, in a certain, I don't mean to be redundant, but you know, how can they do that? I don't understand how they can do that and have it stand. I mean, uh, you know, it seems to me, like you said, it would be the undoing of the whole institution if we're going to do away with well, it. Some you, people you would like to. You've got to drive from JFK or some other airport, to, don't you? And you've got to drive over American soil, That's what you? I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're just saying so how the hell you, can you they can't function? come. Yeah, yeah uh, because of a choice of theirs about what there is. Yeah, and, that's it. You know, they don't want him here because he's, he's known, he's effective. Yeah, but he's because respected. they don't want him here, does that mean that he will be barred? So he's being barred right now, my guess is he'll is get it, in. Will it time. stand for five years? Will it stand for five days? Will it be something real? Well, the, or is it just a harassing thing to... Things are moving very fast They right are now. indeed. No need to talk about five years. No, if, I, if we I, get I'm by just, five weeks, we'll yeah, be yeah, lucky. Yeah, 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 right, right, yeah. We've got, to, <coughs> we've got to prevent the spreading of the conflagration. I mean, we can, yes, a lot sir. of people can get killed in Libya yeah. between now and then. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what has to be sought is peace, and what has yes. to be sought is respect for human rights. And yeah. The United States has got to treat situations equally, and it's got to start looking at, uh, at Saudi Arabia like it looks at Libya, and it's got to start looking at uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory uh, yeah, Coast, yeah, and, yeah. and trying Congo, the Congo. Uh, uh, Congo's, you know, it's almost too late. They've killed yeah, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out there, it's and we've awful. just stood by and whistled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we were in there making money from some of that uh, right. uh, mineral wealth ourselves. So how's it all going to shake <coughs> out? What's it going to come out of this and everything? What? You know, well, it, what's going to come out is the Arab people are going to survive. Mm, yes. And they're going to remember who mistreated them. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, the, the Muslim peoples are angry. We, we right. bring terrorism on ourselves. You create it. There. You only torment people so long before they start trying to retaliate. And an act of terrorism is an act of someone, a powerless person, basically. Why are we doing that? Why are we acting in that way? We said before, a little bit, and a lot of people would, the vision thing or something, uh, what are we doing in Afghanistan? What did we do in Iraq? We voted sanctions, 500,000 people killed, flies, mm -hmm. no fly zones. We invaded, <coughs> bombed Iraq, shock and all. What in the hell are we doing in terms of the United States? Why wouldn't there be people that would be very upset with our idea of how our idea is legitimate, everybody will kowtow to us, or else they'll get bombed or something. I mean, how can that, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't Well, we're coming to the end of that, I, I You hope. think so? Well, I think so. I'm an optimist, though, because it yeah. goes way back. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, ask the Philippine people and a few others. Well, that's turn back, of the 19th goes back century. Before that. But we emerged as a superpower Well, 19th power century, after they suffered, through, they suffered yeah. this day from our domination. But yeah. Well, James they, Joyce has a line I really like to quote. He said, history is a nightmare of injustice from which we're attempting to awaken. Will we ever hear the alarm clock? Will we ever awaken? Is there any room for vision 
about some alteration in the zeitgeist or in the spirit of the age or the technological capability, when you get to weapons that are species lethal, I believe that's true still that they are species lethal, they would, buy, they would eliminate the entire human species. I don't know if you have any chapter and verse on the modeling of that, but I believe that's true. That's a new existential reality. Well, if, uh, even if there's something to that, um, it's madness. Yes, sir. But even, even nuclear weapons are madness. Yes, sir, yes. And yeah. uh, nuclear weapons are a more serious problem right at the moment. Than, yeah. And but so, we've, we've been muddling through for 200,000. Well, we've spent billions of dollars on that kind of stuff for a long time. And it's, yeah. uh, just spending money on it's a crime. Yeah. Because it, can't, it can't have a peaceful use. Well, but we've been muddling through for 200,000 years with an unjust order from feudal orders to arrows and whatnot. We've never had a really just system or something. Do you think there's something in the spirit of this age? As Asimov, we did a program with, he said, this is the defining generation in an evolutionary sense. We've come to the point after 200,000 years, 10,000 generations, we've gotten to a point of qualitative change that will introduce either we could destroy the evolutionary process of consciousness in this particular universe, or there may be something like it's usually called liberation on a system scale for everybody and the ecology that is also characteristic of this particular moment. Well, you, maybe you, that's all off into another realm of thinking, but I think some of his it ideas. It doesn't help were, us deal with the, with the immediate, but uh, yeah. certainly we're in a situation where events are largely in control. Yeah. The United States tries to manipulate them to its um, the economic advantage of economic power of the United States and uh, military dominance, which we have to get out of. We need to. The United States will be a menace to the world until we cut our military budget by 90 percent or more. Yeah. You can't spend that much money on, on arms and not be in trouble. Right. You remember Madeleine Albright saying even to Colin Powell when, yes. he, when we were bombing Serbia, said, yeah. and he was resisting it somewhat, and said, what do you have all those guns for if you're not going to use them? <laughs> you know? yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we up uh, the untouchable in, in our economic crisis right now, the untouchable part of the, the budget is, is, the, is the most inexcusable part, and it's the military. Yeah, right, right. We have to come to grips with things like that. Mm -hmm. But we can't despair and we can't wander off into the belief that we're going to exterminate a whole species or something. We may exterminate the life on the planet if we don't do something about uh, well, that, 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 global warming. Yeah, but for um, well... If I may, I don't think global warming would. Global warming would create conditions that might uh, trigger the, the irrational this no, the, unleashing of the, the assault, weapons. The assault on the environment can destroy life on the planet. This planet can be rendered lifeless as the moon if we keep on. And okay. It can happen fairly fast. Uh, I mean, there are people who think it can happen uh, in the lifetimes of my grandchildren. Uh -huh. the, um, Okay. Who are teenagers or more? Mm -hmm. You mean global warming and that? Global warming is an aspect of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, we can have devastating crop failure. We're threatened with them right now. Yeah, the food costs are going flooding. up now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of things: yeah. floodings and uh, yes, uh, droughts and yeah. uh, <clears throat> the change of things. I mean. You look at the <clears throat> the North Pole. There's a new book back on, out on the North Pole, which is always fascinating. I, mean, I represented the Alaska Federation of Natives for years and get up there on the, on the Bering Straits and uh, yeah. then up on the top there at, um, and and watch. And it, the change up there is, is astounding. Right. People look for years for the Northwest Passageway, and it's there yeah. now. You come yeah, right I through. Know, it's it's true. a very big tanker. It's true. They're getting yeah. a lot of methane from the, the, the permafrost melt so, in Siberia so now, too. We, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't blink at that. It's yeah, easy right. to try to put it down. Uh -huh. It's only one aspect. In the yeah. meantime, we're grinding on with research and development for more ways of killing mass populations in the, with, with new technology, which is a form of madness, you know? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> and now we're trying to decide, you know, whether to, whether to attack um, uh, Libya, but the... Uh, to have Libya as a, as a target of military address now to save lives is, is, is absurd. You're going to take lives if, if you do it. And there are other places where more lives are being lost uh, right now mm -hmm. than, than are being lost there that you, or, than you can save there. Mm -hmm. So we have to retrench. What mm -hmm. we've done to, to Iraq is unbelievable. What we're doing to... I know. Uh, it's just... Discuss yeah, go, I'm sorry. I'm and people say, well, yeah. Saddam Hussein was such a terrible man. but. He, and he, you know, he killed so many people, but he, 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 
he couldn't lay a glove on how many people we've killed and been, are responsible directly and indirectly for deaths in, uh, in Iraq. Just we, nobody paid attention to the sanctions, as you mentioned before, which took a, a million and a half. 500,000? No, they had 500, oh, it was 500,000 children, yeah. more than 500,000 children, yeah. under the age of five yeah. by 19... 98. And Madeleine Albright said to Ms. Stahl yeah. that, well, that's the price for what? No, she, she was asked by Stahl, yeah, Stahl. whether well, it's the price worth it. And she, mm -hmm. look, she turns right to the camera and says, yeah. a very difficult question, but yes, the price is worth it. Yeah. Okay. And then in her uh, autobiography, she explains, well, I didn't really mean it that way. I'm a mm -hmm. little embarrassed by the way it sounded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the kids kept dying, didn't they? Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. comes out the same. Yeah, I know. The, uh, and we, we knew it. I mean, I gave the, the Clinton White House information on that uh, in early 93, in okay. March of 93. Right, right. And they didn't act on it. Right, right, right. They kept them in. They kept the no-fly zone. They'd shoot planes down. They'd shoot people down. You've been defending people uh, that sometimes bring question to the uh, uh, whether the emperor has or has not clothes and so forth for a long time. Used to be back in the old days of COINTELPRO and so forth, it was the commies. It was the commies, remember? Blacklist oh, and sure. all that? Remember, well, that yeah. was it. We had to protect the commies, yeah. or against the commies. Now it's the, is, it now is the, uh, it's, it's, it's Islam. It's Islam, which is the big bugaboo that we're fighting. Uh, this guy now in the Senate is just going to have a big Peter thing King about, in, uh, in the house. Jack, or whatever, yeah, he's in the house, and Peter he's going to have a thing yeah. about, let's get at the Muslim, the, the threat is the Muslim world, and as Muslims in turmoil, the world is in turmoil, there's blowback coming up on a large scale. That could have implications over uh, the uh, Palestine, which is still a major question and all that. So where do you think it's all going from here? What do you think actually will happen in the days, weeks, months, years ahead, coming out of this moment that we began talking about at the beginning of this program? Well, I, I think we see <clears throat> Arab people <clears throat> in the beginning of a struggle for liberation mm -hmm. that will continue until it succeeds, if we're around that long. <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there won't be setbacks. Yeah. And clearly, in any country, even Egypt, with all the exhilaration that we had from driving Mubarak out, the hardest part. Where do we go? Stability is is still ahead, right. and you've got the other countries that are only beginning. But I think it's irreversible because uh, all the people have seen it and they felt it, and uh, they realize, uh, and they won't go back. Mm -hmm. At least that's my that's my view of, of human nature. I th I think uh, the old days where we could control a, a population through a kingdom or an autocratic government and uh, have our way with their resources and keep them in poverty and, and ignorance uh, are over. <clears throat> well, no, we, we, we represent that now. The pattern that we did from 19, since 1776. We've got a thing in order that is not, and we have it reified, almost like a religion that everyone signed on to. The Soviet Union imploded, all the Marxists is out of the way, China's joined on, they're all on our, our page, and that which we have is not adequate to anything except the concentration of wealth in the traditional way, which is getting worse all the time because there's no way to have any way of distributing of any kind of material benefit or income to people other than through this uh, changing, labor of It's changing theirs. radically, and we have to be careful not and to. And he, he questioned that at, a at, a, at, a, at, a, at the level of idea. People would own the assets rather than have them all owned by a tiny class. Everybody else, like serfs, having a job on their estate that they own everything. That's something that's going to have to be questioned, it seems to me, and he was advocating Yeah, we got a long way to go before we can even address that meaningfully because we people are getting killed every day and, yeah. uh, and the yes, world sir. has changed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got this huge productive China coming on like gangbusters Absolutely. now. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes uh, an enormous difference It makes in every, in every respect, including mm -hmm. uh, effect on the environment. Because okay, yeah, pollution. They'll, they'll, they'll have you make been a, there? Yeah, yeah I've been, I started in China in 48 and been there God bless you. frequently sure. since. And the, what yeah. they've built in the last Ten years is just amazing. Yeah. You go to the old city and there's nothing but new shiny buildings. Yeah, there, but you know? out west there's a lot of discontent and there's a lot yeah. of pollution <laughs> going on, a lot of coal. It's a burn. huge country. Yes, and you can argue differences all yeah. over the country. But I yeah. uh, started out in Xinjiang in, in '48, and there was nothing but poverty there now. And now there are people that understand what's going on in the world yeah. and are not happy yeah. with it. But mm. um, we have to. <clears throat> 
in, in the Arab part, while very dramatic mm -hmm. and very much on our scope and, and very significant in terms of mm -hmm. oil, which we've got to stop relying on anyway, yeah. um, is, is a minor part of it. Yeah. But um, what about the Islam part of it? That seems to be the enemy du jour. It's well, not just Arab. It's 1.5 billion, one quarter of the world population is not Islamic. The Arab, the Arab's much smaller than that. It's, yeah, but the Arab's a couple hundred million or something. The Muslim is a <coughs> Muslim is a larger issue. Over, over, oh yeah. Yeah. And to many, the war on terror is a, is a war on Islam. Yes, exactly. That's you what it is. You see it in Peter King's uh, Peter, addresses. that's the fellow. Yeah, he's yeah. running that thing he, right now as we talk. He's using that. And, it's and that's uh, pretty outrageous. Fear. It's yeah. a... Um, <clears throat> it's a uh, religion that um, is decent and has um, led millions and billions of people over the years to decency uh -huh. in their lives oh, and how, yeah. they, how they address each other. Mm -hmm. they're, <clears throat> they're hardly friendlier people in the world if you have trouble than a Muslim. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, you I mean, know, if you're yeah. stumbling along and you need help, uh, mm -hmm. they'll take you into their home. You okay. know, they'll feed you and clothe you and help take care of you. <clears throat> It's interesting to watch, uh, to read in President Obama's um, first book how in his, his five years when he was living in Indonesia, and how wonderful it was. They were poor. They didn't have flush mm. toilets. They didn't have an automobile. They lived mm. on the outskirts of town. He was going to school where they didn't speak English. Mm. And he loved it. He loved the kids. He yeah. loved the families. They were yeah. kind to him. So yeah. he, he understands yeah. Islam is not evil. Yeah. But if you think Islam is evil, then you're in for religious war. Yeah, well, that's something. And that won't end any time in, in, anytime soon. And uh, <clears throat> they're a lot more prepared to die than we are because uh -huh. we've gotten fat and soft, you know. Uh -huh. The, uh, the Crusaders were pretty tough characters. Yeah, they right. could go down from England, take months and months, and <laughs> yeah, go down there and try and kill a bunch of Muslims. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. It's really interesting to see what's going to emerge. I'm just questioning if this is going to turn into a uh, all-out, uh, full-throated war among these people in the country of Libya. What is our position going to be? Are there going to be interventions? There's people who would like to send troops. They could seize this kind of thing. It's a major turning point. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm very confused. Well, we've got to, we really have to pay attention to the now because yes, the now is, is, yes, is a very critical moment and mm -hmm. uh, a major flashpoint with the now, although it, among other flashpoints it's minor, but it can become more significant, is, mm -hmm. is, uh, is Libya. It's minor because it's, it's small and it's minor because the level of violence, the level of military capacity for the United States to take control of there is, is minor. But we have to seek peace, yeah. and, and we have to respect Islam. You, you, yes, okay, and Hugo Chavez has reached out for that. Let's get the facts right. Let's get the thing. How many, you know, that kind of thing, and find some sort of a process. Well, if there's anybody who might be able to help in that and has helped in those kind of situations over a long and extremely distinguished career, it's yourself, and I thank you for sharing your wisdom with us on this day, and I thank you very much for such a very well-led life that obviously continues, and thank you very much for coming in, no, you're kind. Ramsey Clark. Thank you. been your pleasure to have the perception of a, a, a mighty uh, American and world citizen, Ramsey Clark. Happy to have shared those perceptions with you. We're coming back again tomorrow. That's it for this particular